Welcome to the So You Want to Get Fat podcast. I'm your host, not your typical chef, Brian Sow. And today with me, as always, is my ball of buttery French goodness, Frenchie. No, you're supposed to go do the whole routine. What, what Paul, routine? Frenchie, the animal. Paul, Dynam- Frenchie, the animal. Dynamial. Dynamial. <laughs> you happy? Yeah. You well, somebody that? commented. That's why I'm only All saying right. it. But uh, enough about you right now. Because today, because today it's all about Chef Ed Cotton. <laughs> What's Hello. up, buddy? Not too much. Not, Not too much. Too, actually, there is a lot going on. You're you're you're, you're now handicapped. Slight slight handicap. Slight handicap. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll we'll get into that a little later. But yeah. uh, you know, you are you're short one hand lately. As of right now. As of right now. Yeah, yes. yeah. But you're you're on your way to recovery. I'm on the road to recovery as we speak right now. <laughs> right. Uh, actually, I'm going to ask you to bring your mic a little closer to you. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. No problem. Um, all right. Please tell the audience who you are, where you work, what you're about. Well, I am the executive chef partner at Jack and Charlie's down in the West Village, 118 Greenwich Avenue on the corner of 13th Street. It's beautiful American... Cuisine restaurant nestled right into in the heart of the West Village. Yes, yeah, it, and it, a beautiful restaurant. Gorgeous, that it is. Yeah. gorgeous room. We Thank went there you. for dinner a few weeks ago. We actually featured Jack and Charlie's on the podcast that came out today. Oh, it's coming up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That oh, came out today. I, I didn't and, watch it. Yeah, I know you didn't. It's okay. <laughs> I don't. I have zero expectation from you these days. Just so you know. Oh, why? Yeah. For this exact reason, for uh, oh, a podcast came out today. Oh, I thought you were still upset about not checking the bag. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I totally wasn't upset about that, but I am now. Uh, we were going to LA and I had all this equipment to take, mm-hmm. and he fucking flies first class. And I asked him, Hey, I don't want to pay the check in luggage fee. Do you mind checking it in? And he literally just snaps on me and goes what did i tell you when i do this podcast it has to be fun for me and i'm like you know what fuck you i'll check it in and i'll spend the money goddamn baby so uh yeah but there's nothing worse than that you know that that's the bag i would have to wait like 45 minutes for Mm -hmm. no your first class it would come out first i'm telling you it never works out there's a reason why i don't travel with luggage well uh ed sorry about that (laughs) yeah yeah, no i know ed's like like a kid witnessing his parents argue right now (laughs) i'm walking into like the the crossfire mom dad and dad are fucking (laughs) yeah well he was slapping her from behind i don't know (laughs) Well, uh, we've known each other. I think I've known you just as long as I've known Frenchie here. We all kind of got introduced to each other. Yeah, but mine are dog years. (laughs) You're dog years, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, yeah, we've known each other for for quite quite a long time as well. At least a decade. Yeah, at least a decade. And we've uh, uh, come and gone at many restaurants. We even both happened to be working in the Hamptons at the same time, which was very random. But Very true. Good to see you. Uh, no, he was working. Uh, I was a corporate chef for uh, a, a, let's just say a person. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, one of the Hamptons. restaurants, okay. one of the restaurants, two actually were out in uh, Sag Harbor. Mm-hmm. Lo and behold, I happened to be out there at the same time. And it was a nice breath of fresh air because it was like, oh, somebody's sane to talk to. Yeah. Let's have a beer. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. It was very nice. Are you jealous? I, no, I never, are. I never liked the Hamptons. Well, it's Every, not, it you drive, have, you have to drive like a half a day there to be stuck in traffic there to do anything there. Yeah, like what, <laughs> what the funk? That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Well, but it's the Hampton. Yeah, I, I don't get it. It is the Hampton. Ed over here. Uh, we'll we'll talk more about some of his accolades. But what I like to do on the podcast is do some clips. We'll react to some clips. Clips, check out some clips. Clips, clips, yeah. clips, 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 clips. So if I can ask everybody to put on their headphones. Oh, this is the best part. This is the best part. Did you check that all they all work? Yes, I Especially did. Especially Ed's? Ooh, yes. Wow. yes, yes, yes. Do, uh, do you hear me, Ed? I can hear you, Captain. All right, perfect. Um, so, Mr. Ed Cotton. Yes. We, uh... <laughs> Frenchie and I were all, <laughs> Frenchie and I were always were talking about what makes a good story mm-hmm. and uh, you know what what makes like a good movie a good book and we realized you need an enemy you need an enemy you need somebody <laughs> to attack on 
Okay. Or to battle. So we've chosen the worst of them all, <laughs> Jacques Torres. He's anything but. I know. I know. <laughs> but that's the funny part. It's going to be, why are you picking on me? I do nothing to you. So uh, Jacques does these uh, Instagram videos every Tuesday called Tuesday Tip. But and we've been calling it just Jacques, the, just, just the, the tip. tip. <laughs> oh, God. Or actually, Amy come, came up with uh, Jacques' little tip. But <laughs> no, no, no. No, oh. but um, but Jacques uh, Jacques always puts out these uh, Tip Tuesday videos. He's anyway. probably hung like a horse. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, good thirteen inches at least. <laughs> at least, yeah, at least. All right, let's uh, let's do this. Just Bonjour, I am Jacques Torres, and you are with me for hey. Tuesday Tip. We see in New York City on the corner of the streets people roasting nuts. This is exactly the same recipe. I. Uh, <laughs> So it's the tip and the nuts now. Yeah, to yeah, the tips, egg. tip and the nuts. All today. of it, the whole, all of it, the whole package. And they're putting, we're, we're coating sugar. <laughs> we're coating it with Seven sugar, months. baby. Let's it's lubricated. This. Yes. You know, and what's funny is um, I've never met the dude. And uh, yeah. Uh, I, I put I, you I, on I, a I, group text. You did. Uh, all right, so nuts and tips. Here. Let's go. I'm going to add a tiny bit of water just to melt the sugar. And I'm going to start my stove. And I have seven ounces of hazelnuts. So I'm waiting until that start boiling. Start to nicely boil. Now I see the nuts in He's it. making roasted peanuts. Hazelnuts. And then we stir. Peanuts. We want the sugar <laughs> to dry completely and come completely white. He wants it to come completely white. This, that's a, that's a, that's just, that's a street food smell. That's mm. always so attractive. But when you dig into it, it's not as rewarding for some reason. Well, I disagree. Uh, yeah, like I the disagree. smell is is uh, I over, like, overpowerful. Like you can sm walking up here, you, you smelt it. You smelt right, yeah. and it, that smell reminds me of like my very first experience or time in New York City. Dang. And it will always be embedded in the back of my. So that one, garbage juice, feces. Garbage hot juice, dog juice. Yeah, hot dog juice. <laughs> um, what do you call uh, pretzels? Yeah. Right. Like, uh, what's that? Especially in this fucking neighborhood. Now. Yeah, yeah. Canal Street in the middle of the summertime. Ooh. Oof. Oh, that's 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 straight up perfume right there. <laughs> <laughs> you can bottle that. I remember, uh, so when I was growing up, we Agu would- my, Agua de Garbage. Yeah, Agua de Garbage. <laughs> Le garbage. Yeah. Well, growing up, my dad always took me to Chinatown to hang out because we had so much family out there. And I remember during the summers, be like, Dad, it- why does it smell so bad in Chinatown? And my dad just straight up looked at me and he said, because Chinese people are dirty. And just, we kept walking on. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> thanks for clearing yeah, that up. Like, yeah, thanks for clarifying. <laughs> my dad's Chinese. It's okay. <laughs> well, my dad said, no, just kidding. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm sorry. We totally you're, you're missed the nuts. You started getting canceled the other night too. What? You and and you and Harold. Oh, Harold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, so Harold Moore. Oh yeah. He, he loves to do the Marcel voice. You know, the Marcel the Frenchman. Voice. Ah, but okay. when I do the Marcel voice, it easily gets mistaken for a Chinese voice. <laughs> and uh, French was like, "Can you please, like, can you please tone it, <laughs> tone it down? Like, I, I don't want to get canceled <laughs> in, my, in my own restaurant. In my own restaurant. You know, I like this." I, I like, like a dish. Yeah, I guess so it sounds like a like an old Chinese man. Sounds you know? more like a like a <laughs> sounds more like a samurai. Yeah, exactly. I like oh, a dish. A bushido be. Oh. A bushido be. I like a dish. Yeah. Well, yeah. well that's what, well, that's what it was starting to sound <laughs> yeah, like. Yeah. like I, I normally nobody don't do, knows we're doing Marcel. I'm doing a French voice. <laughs> yeah, but it's you know due to my complexion that I yeah. was born with. So but. Harold Moore is the one <laughs> who created the the Marcel voice. Yeah. 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 You know, but what's ironic is he's part Japanese. Yeah, so a quarter, a quarter. So he could get away with doing an he Asian voice. This with Spain, uh, well, we don't answer this one. This could be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that was Jacques' Tuesday tips. White, uh, just nuts. a tip yeah. and nuts today. And nuts, yeah, tip and nuts covered in white sugar. Mm. Mm. Delicious. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and while we are on the theme of Jacques and Frenchmen, mm. I prepared another Jacques clip. <laughs> Jacques Pepin, and I thought he made some very good points in this video. I wanted us to. This is check out. this is that's OG. This is an OG. Mm. What's uh, what's your opinion of the old world, the French cuisine, and all this stuff? Uh, it's the reason why I started cooking. Mm. So, 
it's like gentlemen like this and even Julia Child, um, along with some other uh, oldie but goodies. Yeah, I I loved watching Julia Child grow up. Yeah, we all did. Like we were all that generation. I think it yeah, spanned. I would watch it. Uh, yeah, my parents would put it on. TV Jan can cook. Yeah, yep. I can cook. I didn't watch much. Yeah. Oh, that was he's oh, my yeah. favorite. He was my jam. <laughs> he was, was my favorite. Yeah. I guess my his par- aprons were my favorite though. His aprons? Yeah. Does he have strong apron game? They were embroidered. Uh, yeah, like. Wait, 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 wait! I gotta see this. Oh yeah. Jan can cook. You're easily distracted. I Shame. Am. He used to have embroidered stuff like I. I want to say it said like walk and roll. Uh huh. And like stuff like walk and roll. Walk yeah, at that time, yeah. Oh, you're right. He probably, time, he yeah. probably owns he probably the rights to it. it. You're right. Yeah. You're right. All right. Well, your dad is yes. a chef. Right? Yes. So you still were... currently? Uh... Oh, he's still he's oh, still working. Oh yeah, seventy three. No shit. Seventy three. Still still rocking. Where's rocking he working the kitchen. At? Um, outside of Boston and um, a uh, in Concord. Mm-hmm. If you're from Massachusetts, it's Concord. Mm-hmm. Concord. Concord. Uh, Concord, Mass, a place called Verrill Farms. Mm-hmm. And my dad has been there for quite some time, um, working in the kitchen still. Wow. So, yeah. Holy shit. Kudos yeah, yeah. to him. Yeah. Keeps him young, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you grew up in the, with, around the culinary industry, mm-hmm. much like Frenchie over here. So, you also got a lot of exposure to French cuisine, I'm assuming, as well. Yeah. A little yeah. bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And he went to CIA. Did you go to CIA? I, I did. Okay. I did cash in advance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it was it um Culinary Institute? When of you America. guys went, was it the situation where you had to like graduate that class to get to the next class? Um I did. There were, like every course was a set time and you could only move on to the next one. You, I thought, man, what a scam. They like people paying like two, three times for the same class just I, to be able to go because you're invested. I did suck. really poorly in one class. And I still advanced, but I had to, while I was in the other class, I had to go to the AM class to, right. Oh. So I was still with my, my group. That's how I figured out, um, I was like, wait a second, you could do AM classes too and nobody frowns upon yeah, So was, I did both was, and that's how I was able to get it done quicker. Yeah, it was oh, AM okay. or PM. And I, uh, I cut out of a uh, French class, of course, like, and she's like, like, do you want to like, uh, I could give you the test tomorrow, but I'm just giving you a C. I was like, I don't give a fuck. I'm like, yeah, that's two weeks off. And I get a, and I, cause so who's looking at the grade? You're just yeah. passing to the next class. Yeah. yeah. Math. Did you remember, did you, do you remember like the first class was math? And that's how you realize how the average human being was a fucking moron. Yeah. Oh yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. That was, that was probably the reason why I, <laughs> I was making up that class because it, we were doing culinary math. Yeah. And I was like, it was, Completely foreign to me. I just wanted to cook, man. That's all. I wanted to learn how to make bechamel and hollandaise. Well, well I came into from a French education into an American education, mm-hmm. and I didn't even understand the questions in math they were asking because it's not even positioned the same way. Decimal uh, points uh, are are in France are not decimal points. It's a it's a comma a comma is a decimal comma, and then it's so for me. I was I was like, man, this is super complicated, and I was going into these whole graphs and everything's like dude it's two plus two four that's it that's all it is i'm like what do you mean no it says two point i was like like ah oh. and like they thought i was a moron too so i had to repeat that class <laughs> well i grew up here i learned math here and then i lived in china for six years and every teacher just said you're a moron you, like american math is terrible it is you're an idiot uh and i remember i busted out a calculator because in the states you're allowed to have mm-hmm. a calculator and she's like She's like, she hand you an abacus. She's like, know this. <laughs> she's like, know this, this. Like they did everything in their heads. I That's failed every math class. Yeah, I, I did the math test at the CIA. At, oh, I over complicated it. I was doing like long form and they were like, dude, what are you? We, like they, they never saw it. Mm. Well, let's go back to uh, the OG Frenchman right here, Jacques Pepin. Pepin. I think uh, he says some interesting stuff here. Oh, really quick. Sorry. I, uh, I actually played uh, Patank with him. Oh, yeah. Against him. And I threw the winning shot. Wait, what's Patank? Look at oh, Ed coming oh. in and just taking over and yeah. shining, <laughs> uh, shining us. Are you gaslighting us? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what's Patank? Patank is bocce ball. But with instead of wooden balls, it's their metal. 
And you throw, uh, it's over instead of underhand. Correct. The Italians. Wait, is it is it like in the parks? Uh, yeah, they have that the, little sand lot. The and Italians, then, oh, they oh, oh. roll it like yeah. a bowling ball. It's yeah. underhand. And then the patank, the it's French like a version, softball. is you kind of lob it Overhand this way. It. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you beat him. Uh, yeah, I threw the winning shot. I actually have a photo of it. Uh, it was him, his wife, uh, and an, their friends. So it was four of them versus four of us. Uh-huh. Um, it was uh, sponsored by Loot. What was it? They do it every year. You want to do it? I I, I didn't they, even know what the fuck this game was until now. They're always constantly don't... asking for participants. Yeah, that was the last time I played. So. I you do not want me on any sports anything. Go sports! But this but this is a type of sport where you can have a drink, you can smoke. You oh, can, okay. yeah. Now I, I'm interested. Yeah, yeah. I, I blacked out at the end of the game. Yeah. we were we were just drinking. <laughs> That's for the net, whole point. Like, you're drinking for nets too. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. we were. We were Slamming the fernet down like no one's business. Nice. All right. Fernet Branca? Yeah. I well, want. that's um, Billy Joel's a favorite uh, oh, yeah? liquor of choice. Oh, yes. I know very well what he drinks. Because huh. he drank a whole bottle here at Le Rivage for the premiere of his Broadway show. That's the evening that he crashed his car into someone's house. <laughs> and that's when I thought Le Rivage was going to be front page news. <laughs> I was like, oh, fuck me. <laughs> French chef. And you open my book, one of my book, and you may see a black bean soup with banana and cilantro on page 32 because my wife, born in New York City, was Puerto Rican and Cuban. And then I may have a shirazi sushi, which I love, lobster roll from Connecticut, or whatever. Tasting all kinds of fruits from all, of the, all over the world will expand your palate, will expand your knowledge of food. Will expand so basically, your don't assume I just cook French food. <laughs> okay, we got it. <laughs> We got it. Respect, 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 respect. respect. Sorry. You're just paying respect. You know, we're going from one jock to another jock. Yeah, yeah but now I'm the villain. <laughs> I thought like, no, we don't need to seek, seek out the villain. We need to be the villain. Oh, oh you're saying we be the villain. Yeah, we're the heel. Oh, oh, we're okay. going to be the heel. Okay. Do you want to join our super evil group of chefs? <laughs> uh, just let me get back Axis to you. of evil. <laughs> That's, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna bow out. Ed is like yeah. Ed's gonna text us later, be like, "I am never coming on to this po- fucking okay. podcast again." Yeah. <laughs> all right. No, come on. I love I love Pippin. Come on, that's no. our hero. No, no, he's he's the man. Uh, all right. This next segment I call the not so current news. <laughs> do, 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 do. You're not gonna do the song with me. I n- I've never done it before. Yes, you have. It literally was on. The podcast. Okay, No, it was. Because the first one sounded like the Wizard of Oz. I was trying to figure out what he was doing. Here, the flying monkey. Oh, the Wiz is playing on Broadway. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't know that a few times. I didn't know. You didn't know. Real. That's how. That shows you how many times I walk in that direction. All right, a Vietnamese restaurant in Portland has closed because a neighbor complained about the smell. Mm. I thought your father said it was Chinese people. Oh my God, fucking Christ. No, this is, uh, how many times, how many times uh, do you hear these stories of, you know, especially places that open in close quarters to residential, you have yeah. noise complaints, smells, yeah. like a popular bar. Every time uh, you open up in a residential, you, you have someone that's contacting the community board Every fucking day yeah. and making your life miserable. Yeah. Can I share something? Yes. Oh, we, yes. all, we all have these. Yes. <laughs> is this for the sidewalk? Uh, no, this is noise level. Um, Let me right, see what our, else is our there. Ventil- hood, hood ventilation. Okay. Okay. Uh, hood our noise. ventilation system. We're in a hundred year old building. The space that I'm currently in has been a restaurant for well all over f- well over fifty years at least. Okay, so. The the re- the apartments above us are all rent stabilized, and <laughs> you know they're probably paying what five hundred dollars a month for right. rent. Not, if you're lucky. So there's this one gentleman, and that, he makes it his life purpose to. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And why do you think this building is empty? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he is uh, not thrilled about us operating um, as a restaurant and just says hey the smell this and that blah blah even blah even though you guys are probably contributing to, hugely to, to the that value neighbor. of that building yeah, yeah to that building that yes. neighborhood the landlord is making money from on from the restaurant yeah. and is losing money yeah. from the tenants yeah. 
Exactly. So um, <coughs> he filed a complaint, and but we get weekly visits by 311, like the buildings department yeah. and all that, and they inspect, they look at the hood system, the exhaust, and we rented the space as is. We didn't make any modifications. It's right. Like, you didn't so, pull any permits. No. So we just... We just turned the lights on, turned the stoves on, mm -hmm. kind of as is. Uh, yeah, it so, was approved. Yes, for, so, for forever. So he took it one more step uh, further, and now he filed a. You know, when you're always looking for something, you can't find it. Um, he, we have a claim from State Farms saying that we've affected his health. Um, oh my god! Yeah, yeah. Um, we might have to uh, come back to that one. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm familiar with this. I have that one the one step that goes into the back room mm -hmm. in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. I call that the eight million dollar step. Oh, yeah, I, because I got that, sued for eight million dollars. Right, right, right. Because Oof. someone she said that she couldn't see the step and everything. Right. Meanwhile, there are two lights on it. There's a strip on it. I have two different carpet colors to make sure like yeah. you can see the thing. There's a, there, there were two ramps on each side for one step. I mean, everything was there. And she draw, dragged us through the courts and everything, only to find out that she fell because her hip broke first. And that's why she fell. That was the end result. Oh. That, and she, like, she yeah. broke her hip, but most... But most cases when all people break their hips, it's not from the fall. It's because it breaks and they right. fall. They, yeah, they like destabilize, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's, you know, and that was the case there because there was, yeah. well, they just. Well, was, whenever you have people living in close quarters, especially at a businesses, you're always going to run into issues like this, unfortunately. Like one of my favorite venues to watch heavy metal shows, St. Vitus. Oh, yeah. They I know. were recently but shut down. But did they catch that guy? They caught him, right? No, no, no. They were shut down by the building department. Yes, because, because some kid fucking blew them up. Like, was got kicked out of there and then reported them to the building I'm, department. I'm not sure if it was a kid or whoever. Oh, but... my sister sent me that. Oh, really? Oh, your, yeah. your sister did. She was like, they. Yeah. I was, I was just predicting that lately there's been a lot of gentrification of that area because yes. I know for a fact. The upstairs apartment, oh, maybe I shouldn't reveal this, but anyway, whoever's living in the upstairs apartment is definitely not going to report them downstairs yes. because they have very good reason uh, to want St. Vitus to have every success it possibly can, right? Right. But this new but building- then got a, a There could be a partnership in that building where they want to get rid of St. Vitus because right. they can rent it out for buku more dollars. Maybe, maybe, especially so, now. There's a lot of things. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But there, but part of the situation was like there's some kid that they they threw out, like also called in like a, a fire hazard yeah, too. So. That that doesn't surprise that doesn't surprise help. me either. All I'm, of it could be true though. Yeah, could all be true. I remember growing up, there was this crazy lady who lived across the street and would call the building department on my parents all the time because my dad was the only person on the block who would stand up to her. This lady was fucking batshit crazy and would say the most insane stuff. I remember as a kid walking home and. Um, I used to walk on her side of the block and then cross the street, and she would be like, "Stay away from my house, you fucking chink!" Or you, fucking oh, yeah, like, yeah. Blade, like oh yeah, blade and just straight up. Hmm. And I remember there was once our next door neighbor, who's Indian, his car broke down in front of her house, but on the street, wasn't on her driveway, wasn't even on her parking spot. Just literally broke down right before he could pull into his, his, driveway. his driveway. And he knows my dad's a mechanic, so he came knocking on the door. Hey, can you give me a hand? My dad's like, like no problem. My dad was helping uh, our neighbor push their car onto a parking spot, and this lady comes out, and she just, she goes to the Indian guys, and this was right around 9-11. Uh, so she just goes up to the Indian guy and says, get the fuck out of my house, you Taliban, Taliban motherfucker, this and that. And I remember my dad was like, bitch, if you don't calm down, I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> just straight up like, like I'm going to slash your tires and kill you, you know? Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, ever since then, she would just call the building department on my dad or this and that. So, but yeah, bitch, but, you were crazy first. But, but, but also, you know, there's there's a painful, uh, you know, barrier there. Mm. But but once the same people come over and it's like, ah, oh, we're dealing with this fucking right. person again, and right. it, then it blows over. But yeah. you have to suffer in the meantime. That's the problem. Yeah. Portland, Oregon. Yeah, they, I guess they uh they don't. Uh... Oh, Northeast. Okay, so it's not that Portland. But I was going to segue into Oregon pioneering drug decrimin decriminalization efforts faces 
rollback. So well, they, what do you expect when you can <laughs> fucking shoot meth in the middle of the street? And well, right now it's all about fentanyl. Hmm. Yeah, we see in a lot of this, uh, a, lot, a lot of this in New York, but it's not legalized in New York. They completely decriminalized all drug use uh, for almost like three. <laughs> Three years now, and uh, well, didn't work out. Didn't work out. <laughs> oh, it didn't. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I wouldn't have guessed. Yeah, yeah. I would. I would have never guessed. Uh, Eater, why do we fetishize orange egg yolks? What are your opinions on egg that's, yolks? But that because that's the real color. <laughs> yeah, we've yeah, been yeah. acclimated to think that they're supposed to be the pale yellow. No, no, no. Now people want like the bright orange yolks. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what they're supposed to look like. Is that, yeah. Is that, <laughs> I, Ed, does Ed need to translate what I'm saying to you now? <laughs> I mean, it, you can get, uh, I mean, maybe people were used to having eggs from Chernobyl farms, you know, <laughs> where it's like a different color, but that's the original color, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's the original. Yeah. yeah, And, you know, also it depends on the breed and what the egg is, uh, what the chicken is eating. Like my dad has uh, hundreds of chickens and his yolks aren't that bright yellow, but I also know he's... Uh, I don't know what the fuck he's. Oh, they could them. be darker well, than that. Dan Barber yeah. did a great experiment, and he's always pushing. Who's Dan said, Barber? Let the audience know. Well, you know Dan Barber at uh, Blue Hill Stone Barns. Mm -hmm. um, the property's just out of this world, but like he fed uh, a number of different varieties of this and that to his chickens, and like he settled on like feeding his chickens like bell peppers, red bell peppers, and like the end result was like red, like. Fire engine red, mm. um, and it it looked it looked pretty cool. If you follow him on Instagram, he's always doing all also all, all sorts of different types of uh, you know test Ooh, runs this, and this, stuff. This may have to be a new uh, new Instagram yeah. channel that we follow. Well, yeah. it's why flamingos are pink. Oh, because uh, they eat the, the shrimp. They eat a lot of shrimp. Yeah. Oh, same thing with uh, salmon meat. Mm -hmm. Right, the farm stuff uh, would come out gray. Gray. But they, they have, have to feed to, them yeah. Yeah, food it's, coloring. It's all their diet. <laughs> all yeah. right. Wanted your take on this, Mr. Ed Cotton. Uh -huh. Why does Hell's Kitchen still celebrate toxic chef culture? What does that mean to you, toxic shelf culture? Because I would- Missing skin, <laughs> blisters, <laughs> yeah. gouges from knives, <laughs> pan across the head, because I, I, shit getting thrown at you. <laughs> Yeah, getting uh, kicked in the ass. Yeah, <laughs> getting yelled at a lot, which is the the like the lightest thing that could happen to you in a kitchen. But I would I like to think that all of us here have experienced some of the old old school kitchen culture. I think my uh, what I grew up with, uh, mm -hmm. what I, who I worked for, they were kind of the last it, of the it, old it, school sh toxic culture chefs. All these but, old chefs, I like. It's like, well, that's how it worked, and they disciplined you. It's like, no, 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 no. It's it's like it's like from sufferings you're gonna learn. No, no right, you're, right. You're, you're killing passion. Right, right, but I want to hear it from Ed. Like you well, know, did you work for anybody like that? Your dad yes. was a chef. I mean, what was his? Um... I heard from an old vendor that um, <clears throat> he my my dad was a, a very tough guy to work mm -hmm. for. And that's about it. So I, I don't have any. <laughs> I don't have any. <laughs> I don't have any stories really about uh, to speak of. Uh, about my father, mm. but uh, past experiences throughout my 30 years of cooking in this industry have, you know, I've, I've seen, yeah, I've witnessed firsthand experiences right. and this and that. But um, as we progress and get through, you know, uh, you know, 10 years, things drastically have changed, you know, from, you know, when I right, probably... Maybe even more, probably like twelve to fifteen years ago. Yeah. Was it was still pretty, pretty ferocious. Yeah. Um, so I think within the past decade, I think everybody has has found the right uh, medication and prescriptions <laughs> and stuff like that. So I, you know, I have another uh, reason why it all calmed down too. Why? Because these fucking chefs were starting to get sued. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. the restaurants were starting to get sued. Yep. Yep. So everybody calm the fuck down. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the I do agree with you. 50, even as recent as 15 years ago, the culture was definitely that way, and you started to see a shift. But to answer this question, why does Hell's Kitchen still celebrate toxic chef culture? It's because it, it sells. sells. It's the ratings. It's a TV, TV show. It's a TV yeah. show. Yeah. So, so there you go. Uh, as if you keep watching it, he's going to keep yelling the shit out. Does he? So. It, 
He does. He still does that I version of it. I haven't watched like food TV in fucking ages. Yeah. So I, I honestly couldn't tell you. I wonder if he's I, I actually. Stopped, I stopped when as soon as Ed wasn't on TV anymore. I'm like, yeah. fuck it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's done. Well, no, you're still you judge nowadays, right? Uh, I did judge. Yeah. yeah, they brought me back to be a judge. Beat and, Bobby uh, Flay. Yeah, yeah. Beat yeah. Bobby Flay. So winner of Beat Bobby Flay yeah. and now judge. Yep. Loser. Still loser. <laughs> Still loser. Beat Bobby Flay. I would go back in a second, though, to compete any anytime. Oh, so, yeah? Really? They, they actually, I got a phone call a few weeks ago, and I told them that I had I had messed up my hand. Mm-hmm. Um, Can I do this with one, one, one hand tied behind my back? So, yeah. That would be a nice gimmick. Uh, so I had to, they were interested in speaking with me mm-hmm. uh, or to me about uh, possibly uh, going on to one of Bobby Flay's shows or something like that again. Right on. Uh, but I, I can't participate at the moment until my hand is back up and running. Yeah, so. yeah. All right. Well, uh, one more news segment. Um, U.S. man upsizes his own Guinness World Record for most Big Macs eaten in a lifetime. And uh, here he says, Mr. Donald Gorsk used to eat nine Big Macs a day, but mm-hmm. now has cut it down to two, one for lunch and one for dinner. Before you grimace at his diet, Mr. Gorsk, Gorsk does not have any health issues because he walks more than nine kilometers a day and does not eat French fries. I'm healthy as a horse. I weigh around 86 kg. What's that? Kilos. One, one, yeah, I, it's, you double, I know what kg uh, Approximately is double yeah, it. Yeah, double it, right. 180 pounds, something like that, right? Because it's one, whatever, it doesn't matter. He's, so he's healthy as he's a healthy. horse. He's it's healthy. It's probably horse meat anyway, so, <laughs> right? Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. When was the last time you guys had a Big Mac? Because oh. apparently now it's okay. And McDonald's is making a lot of changes to improve their product. Remember we yeah, reacted we to that video. This. Yeah, I can't tell you the last time I had any any McDonald's fast food in general. Uh, yeah. Uh, when Blondie was pregnant, she had that was one of her weird cravings. Like the, McDonald's, the chicken sandwich at McDonald's. Mm. Like for some reason, and 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 the shake she needed. It was that and a shake almost every fucking day. Hmm. God damn. That sounds like I was just life. like, Ugh. About six months ago, I found myself sitting at a Taco Bell in Greenpoint off of McGinnis. Blasphemy. I was, <laughs> How was it? Was it worth it? Yeah. I, I, I like Taco Bell, and uh, everyone I'm, always gives me shit about it. I, but, uh, no, well, I'm, I thought that was the problem, that he gave you shit. <laughs> well, that's the story, but I've never had no, that problem. White Castle, man. Oh, oh, that, that is White I, Castle, but White yeah. Castle's worth it. Yeah. It's worth the suffering. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Butter has become the main character, Grub Street says. Butter is no longer supporting player to bread. It's the star of the show it's at restaurants this, around the are country. You doing this? No, I'm not doing it. And it's moving out of the it's uh, it isn't moving out of the spotlight anytime soon. Do you soon. see the the Gary Don with mm-hmm. the butter and they come do the butter show in front of you? Yeah, Quality um uh Italian does that? No, not Italian, but the the French one. Bistro. Uh, yeah, uh, 52nd, yeah. I think, or whatever. Yeah. They have a, a butter board or, or a Garridon with, like, it looks pretty dope. Garridon. <laughs> When's the last time you heard that word? I have not heard that in ages, <laughs> but I, I I still say it a lot. <laughs> Do you? Oh, yeah. What, like, for what, what's the context? Um, get the Gary Dunn no, to table because, six, six. Yeah, yeah. Because um, <laughs> we have, we do a Bloody Mary, like our Bloody Mary cart or yeah. Gary Dunn. So on the weekends, we have a beautiful um array of different types of things that you can add into your bloody mary mm-hmm. it's kind of like we push it ar- around the dining room yeah. and so we get it is a, a fancy word for a movable fixings bar <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good way of putting it i want to have i want to i want to experience this uh, bloody mary gary don yeah, yeah we should go we should go back usually when i'm uh, ordering bloody mary i'm in no shape to care <laughs> <laughs> There's that too. Nothing's better than a good Bloody Mary when you're hung the fuck over. Or taking a flight at six in the morning. Oh, oh, fuck. Jeez. <laughs> yes. I almost forgot about that. We were in LA and we we're going home and uh, we were at the airport at six in the morning. And man, did, did, did this lady like really load up the fucking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bloody Marys with vodka. It so great. it's just like vodka with a splash of tomato? More or less. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and don't forget the celery stick. Oh, yeah. 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 And I had to go back to my family in San Francisco, and I was annihilated when I landed. <laughs> it's great. It's great. You should join us next. Well, time. I was additionally annihilated. <laughs> yeah. 
Because I, I, I topped that too. So yes. it was pretty productive. It was very productive. Okay, good. Yeah, hundred percent. Our audience knows us and our backgrounds very. Are we well. done with this? Yes. Yeah. Actually, oh. we, yeah, we can take this off. Yeah, we can take this. Thank off. you. Yes. So, Frenchie's uh, Frenchie's ears are are mm -hmm. fatter these days, and they sweat easily. So. True, <laughs> but you don't have to call me out. Um, I wanted the audience to get to know you a little better because you've come on to Pro Chef Reacts. Yeah. You know, I think you've given bits and pieces, but you know, tell the audience about where you come from and how you got into the culinary industry and some of your accolades. Let's see. Uh, look, I've I've been doing this. You know, I'm 46. I started when I was 14. My dad was a chef, still cooks. I grew up in the industry. Never wanted to do anything else mm. other than cook. Um, and then, you know, he Never told wanted me, or didn't know you had another choice? <laughs> I, I did, <laughs> two of he, he straight up said to me, he's like, you know, I went to a vocational school because I knew that I wasn't going to be good. Academics, like, weren't for me, really. I was I'm more of a hands-on. Uh, yeah, I'm a trades person. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so I enjoyed, I always gravitated towards cooking. Now we can call ourselves artists. Yes. Yes. But in those days, yeah, the trade. Now, yeah. now we're artists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it was either I was going to actually be an artist, I, I draw and all that stuff. And so, you know, but I was going to go to school for graphic design. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed that. But he was like, you know, hey, these are your options. It's like, you, you really want to work in the kitchens and cook. It's, I love it. And, you really want to, you know, draw this and that. I'm like, yeah, I love that too. And he's like, well, if you really want to do the cooking thing, I fully support you. You know, so he was very supportive of which, which, whatever I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I ended up obviously choosing the culinary uh, route because it is an art anyway. Mm -hmm. So I got to be creative and create things from nothing, like as if it was a blank canvas right. and I could draw and this and that. But uh, so. So full support and, uh, you know, I've never really looked back and said like, oh, like, I wonder what would have happened if I did that. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, And did you start by working for him or like what was the first steps for you diving into this career field? I never worked for my dad. My parents had a restaurant and I would help out every so often, mm -hmm. but I really immersed mm -hmm. myself. This, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. This was you would help them every so often. This is while you were growing up. This was before you made the decision you're gonna do this for real as a career. I had already started working in like sandwich shops mm -hmm. and ice cream shops and stuff like that. Um, and then while my parents were operating, you know, their restaurant, mm -hmm. and I would, if so and so called out sick, I would I would help out. But oh, okay. I didn't really. I, I, I wanted to see other things. Mm -hmm. so. was, was your dad's philosophy like kind of like my dad? Like they use you for labor when you haven't picked that as your career. But then as soon as you pick, made that decision to make that as your career, my dad's like, okay, you can't work here anymore. You got to go elsewhere. I don't um, want to see you. No, I think my dad knew that I, I, I enjoyed, you know, I enjoyed helping him out and, and cooking the food that they, they were cooking at the restaurant. But I really wanted to, I wanted to work in Boston for the best chefs and really experience, you know, the, the real, like, you get the Boston experience and work for like, you know, Jasper White, Lydia Shire, Gordon Hammersley, and all of these, these huge influence, influential chefs in Boston. And uh, I was on a mission anyway. Mm -hmm. So, but, um, uh, you know, he fully supported me, and from there, um, after I graduated from high school, I enrolled in the Culinary mm -hmm. Institute of America, which my father also went to the Culinary Institute of America. Oh, cool. and that was one thing where he said to me, he was like, there's no other school you're going to other than the Culinary Institute of America. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, sure, because <laughs> it's the, you know, the most prestigious culinary school in America. Yeah. You know, it's the the Harvard of culinary schools. As they like to say. Yes. Yeah. So Is that what they call it? Well, uh, well it's the know. landscaping. They have yeah. really nice landscaping They do there. have wonderful <laughs> landscaping. They have a great horticulture program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely an Ivy League school. There's Ivy on the yes. building. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, you know, he was thrilled mm -hmm. and, and still is thrilled that I did attend the same culinary school as him. So 
Um, yeah, so you know, full full parental support the whole the whole journey, and mm. they continue to support uh, me and what Sounds I like do. Ed got some good parenting. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I can't complain. I had I, I have I still have the best parents in the world. That's awesome. So yeah, that's awesome. So uh, all right. Uh, I'm assuming you worked jobs here and there during high school. You mm -hmm. mentioned you started working. Uh, you would help out your parents. Went to culinary school. Did you work any full time before you went to culinary school, or was it culinary school and then you just went into the workforce? So, high school, graduated <laughs> high school. The CIA had like every three week enrollments, mm -hmm. I think, or maybe it was six weeks. I think it was three. Well, three so weeks, I, yeah. I, I yeah. took right I, three, three weeks. weeks every three I weeks, took yeah. a few months off and. I started in February 96 mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. And so so I was working at the time in high school I was working for Todd English in oh. in Charlestown. Um and so I the news loves Todd English. I know. <laughs> well, look, I look started working for Todd English. He's I, hard to miss with that big head. Oh my God. <laughs> I started working for him in 1994. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was in Charlestown, you know, home of the townies, you know, but then I graduated high school, continued to work for him. And then I went to the CIA, came back, did my externship back in Boston mm -hmm. for Todd, um, at Olives. And then after graduating from, um, culinary school, I flew out to Las Vegas and I lived there for about a year and opened mm -hmm. up Todd's restaurant at the Bellagio Hotel. Ah, okay. Did that for a year when I was 21. And then after a year, I was like, this is, you know, it's, it's just a little, it's not my thing. Mm -hmm. I moved back to Boston for a couple of years to, to put my thinking cap on and work for some good chefs. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I was like, New York, I'm New York bound. Mm -hmm. So New York was supposed to only be like a two year stint for me. So I could go back to Boston and be uh -huh. like, I got New York experience uh, -huh. <laughs> uh yeah i'm yeah. still here everybody yeah, yeah, <laughs> so um hey, how long has it been 22 or 23 years holy cow yeah well i feel like we glanced over a few big parts of your career which is uh so you you go to culinary school you work for todd english you go to vegas how did the becoming uh cat cora sous chef happen and did you start as her sous chef mm -hmm. a cat cora uh is I guess still is an Iron Chef, but doesn't go on the show anymore. If yeah, I'm I don't, not mistaken. I guess once an Iron Chef, always an Iron Chef. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, so she was a regular <clears throat> competitor on Iron Chef America, mm -hmm. and you were a sous chef. So, yeah. did you become her sous chef first at one of her restaurants, and she kind of took you along for the ride? Or tell us a little bit more about that. Well, story. that was an interesting. So that was my first real ex exposure or introduction to um, the TV world. Mm -hmm. um, I was working for Danielle Baloud at Restaurant Danielle, and a friend of mine, uh, who was the sous chef at Danielle at the time, was like, "Hey, man!" And I don't know how he got linked mm -hmm. up with the whole thing. Still don't know. I have not. I've never really asked who, him. Who was that? Who was the sous chef at the time? Uh, it was a um, a gentleman, uh, Brian Reimer. He's out in uh, California right now. Very talented individual, but he was one of the you know at the time one of the only American sous chefs at Danielle, you know, um, this is after the Alex Lee mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so after that, you know, Jean-Francois was, was promoted to the chef of the restaurant. So it was around that time. <clears throat> so Brian came up to me and, and I've known him since he worked in Boston at another restaurant, Michael Schlau at this restaurant called Radius. And so he moved to New York almost around, around the same time I did. And we reconnected by working for mm -hmm. Danielle at mm -hmm. the same time. But anyway, Brian's like, hey, man, would you be interested in doing a couple of shows for Cat Cora on Iron Chef America? I have some conflicting dates, whatever, this and that. And I'm like, uh, yeah, you can give her assistant my information, yeah. this and that. So um, the, her assistant had reached out to me and asked to schedule uh, like a meet and greet. Mm -hmm. I met her down um, at Chelsea Market, where the Food Network, uh, it's no longer in that building anymore. Right. But we met there um, at Marimoto. Yeah. And sorry to put you yeah. on pause. So, uh, Food Network Studios, they filmed in the same building where Chelsea Market is yeah. today. I think they've moved out since. I'm not sure. But yeah, that's where everything was done at the yeah, time. Yeah. I think yeah. they're in like the 20s and like 
Park Avenue now or something, okay. and they don't have a studio anymore. They kind of bounce all over the place. But gotcha. it was impressive. I mean, mm-hmm. I, t- so I, I met her, talked to her. It was a quick little interview, and she's like, would you be interested? Are you able to do, like, one show with us? And, you know, Brian can't do it. I was like, yeah, I can do it, you know. Sure. So Brian was working at a restaurant with you and he was competing with her on the show. Yeah, he was he was acting as her sous, okay, sous gotcha, chef on gotcha. the show. Okay. There was three of us. Okay. So it was it was Kat and then there was a, another woman, uh Laura Lynn, and then there was either Brian and then I got thrown into the mix. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there was So this is a team they don't work together in a restaurant. This is a team just for television. Yeah. Which there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there was more of a connection between Kat and Laura Lynn. Okay. Uh, They have known each other for a a number of years. So um, so we we kind of got thrown into the mix, Mm -hmm. Brian first, and then um, then I agreed to do one show, Mm -hmm. and then that that turned into like, hey, are you available? This this date, are you available? That date, are you available? And then I did it for six seasons. Wow. So it turned into a long, cool experience. Yeah, you know? yeah. So. Uh, and uh, approx- do you know approximately how many episodes that was? Oh, no. no oh. I, would, I would probably have to Google that. But like, if I go back to all like my, my emails and stuff mm-hmm. like that, like our exchanges, like it's, it goes on for years. So we, we filmed a fair amount of shows together. Wow. wow. So this is... Um, so this is like a... These Iron Chef teams are like a superhero team that assembles just for the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Twin Powers uh, activate <laughs> form as like you know, Iron Chef America team. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it it was it was a cool experience because that was something that I used to watch mm-hmm. in my you know at late night the original mm-hmm. Iron Chef. Mm-hmm. You know when Marimoto and all the, all yeah, the OGs the, the Japanese were on one. It. That yeah, was yeah, some serious yeah. stuff. Uh, so for me to be asked to be part of something that was pretty like historic or yeah. just badass. And I would argue that time you were on was like the real heyday of Food Network mm-hmm. where, you know, everything they did was everything. Yeah, everything was, was Iron gold. Chef. Like that really yeah. pushed, you know, attention towards the food, the food world. world. Yeah. yeah. Really um, painted the culinary industry in this glamorous light. And I think... That was also the time where it was much easier to find young cooks because mm-hmm. so many people were inspired yes, by the shows excited. and they were excited. And then you mm-hmm. could trick them to, into, <laughs> we could trick them <laughs> yeah, into the industry. Yes. Yes, you can't can. do this no more. And then Anthony Bourdain puts out a book and uh, oh. paints the real picture. And then that, I yeah. think that was like the beginning of the end of people realizing, oh, this industry isn't so glamorous. No. After. Like, I like to eat at restaurants, I don't want to work yeah. in zero. He brought out all the dirty laundry. Yeah, yeah, but I think he made it cool. He made it cool. He made it intriguing yeah. for for people. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> yes, he exposed. The, Listen, the, everything the has its good and bad. Yeah, you yeah. know, I still remember the people that you know that got fucked over by that book. <laughs> <laughs> any highlights from your time working uh, doing Iron Chef? Like anything that stands out in specific that people who are watching should uh, try to dig up that episode and see what you're talking about. I guess you had to be there in the in the audience, but mm-hmm. like <clears throat> I would just go balls to the wall, man. Like I w- I would push myself mm. in a way that I've never pushed myself before, and to see the end result under these ins- insane time restraints, mm-hmm. <clears throat> to physically see what I just physically did under like. Duress. Uh, under extreme, duress, yeah, yeah. Extreme duress, yeah. Uh, like, and uh, honestly, full on, full on sweat. Yeah. Like, um, the sweat mode, like. So on that show, the duress was real. Yeah. Because I remember, like, on Bobby Flynn, that, that duress isn't very real. It's, it, what, when the, I mean, when the, the editing clock, creates the, that, you know. When the clock starts going, that's, that's real time. Yeah. All right. When you're, you're doing the battle, it's not like, all right, hold on, stop. Stop. Right, right. It's yeah. it's full on like there's really a clock going. Yeah. So, but I would I really wanted to push myself and show everybody, especially Kat and the judges mm-hmm. and the food the people at the food network that like holy shit, this guy Ed, 
he's like the Tasmanian devil. <laughs> and he's yeah. he's just banging shit out left and right. Oh, I'm not trying to show up. I'm not trying to show up anybody. But you had that line energy. But I want, yes, I have that. Line the, the energy, here. that's a good way yeah. to put it. When, when, yeah, you yeah. could quote me on that, yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll put on a t-shirt, don't worry. No worries. Merchandise. <laughs> but to like make. And line is not the cocaine line. Yeah, it's yeah the, no cocaine line. That's a different line. That's a different line. That was that. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. Woo, let's yeah. make that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought yeah, of it. Let's make that clear. Cocaine lines after you go to the bar, you're a little tired from your shift on the line. On the line That's what he means by that line energy. You know, at a kitchen, you're working on the line, pasta station, whatever. You're working on the line. And then cocaine lines. I just want to clarify that, folks. But... So you have me here, <laughs> but I tell you, after when that buzzer would go off, and we would, we would, I would come over with that bottle of Uzo. That little shot, just woo, I tell you, went that, a long that way. Was the best. That, that was the best thing. And I don't drink Uzo, but I mean, for it's, people it's who don't know, yeah. for people who don't know, like you need to hydrate in the kitchen, right? Yes. You need to drink a lot of water. Yeah. yeah. And if you're on the, but but if you know how to do this, like you're 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 ending, you can uh, you can re revitalize with booze yeah. instead of water, and that hits you real yeah. quick. Oh yeah, <laughs> and and it was just like, and Kat, she wasn't a she wasn't a big drinker on the show, and I would just I'd try to find the biggest like glasses because a, a shot. I mean, yeah. come on, no, no, we're we're drinking at least. I'm doing an eight ounce shot of ooze. <laughs> I'm praying to God it doesn't come out of my nose. It's it's ooh. yeah, but I tell like you that was it was such a great experience and a great thing to be part of. Mm -hmm. And I got to travel from it as well. We we they we flew out to Hawaii and we did a huge special out oh, there. Cool. And, um, so I got to be part of that yeah. that whole family. Yeah. Um, Never been to Hawaii. Well, really? Nope. No, it's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. Let's go. Beautiful. beautiful. I like Let's this. Go. We go. I like we go. This is Marcel voice. This is the Marcel nah, voice, is, dude. Do not, we have to explain this, this every time now? Voice. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um. Well, very cool. Uh, but we talked about. Uh, we talked I about. I just realized how Iron Chef that America. we worked in the same space, restaurant space, but a couple of decades apart. Well. Because Danielle's was the original Le Cirque. Yes. Oh, okay. so you were there. I was a Le Cirque, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Not yeah. to date myself, but... So Iron Chef America, I would say, is the premier food show at the time. And then another show comes along that becomes equally, if not bigger mm -hmm. than Iron Chef America, Top Chef. Yes. Which you were on season seven, yeah. runner up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you did pretty damn well. And that's another show you probably did a shit ton of traveling for as oh, well, yeah. right? Got yeah. to see a lot of the country. I did. Uh, it's very ironic, uh, the controversy that happened because he what? fucking hates peas. I don't know if you know this. Huh. He hates peas. So so catch me up. What was the controversy? Right, well, I'll let, I'll let Ed tell you the controversy. Um. It was, uh, God, I, I forget where we were, but I know I was preparing a butter poached lobster and it was around the spring season and stuff like that. So what better way to do a butter poached lobster with like an English pea puree, like a nice little fricassee, <laughs> asparagus, <laughs> asparagus, you know, mushrooms. I'm not, I, I love Ed, but no, peas, is, uh, I don't love you that much. <laughs> so I made this pea puree to accompany the lobster. And come time to go in and cook. We, we you know, we prepared everything the, the day before and packed up our coolers and hands up, you know, you know, walk away and this and that. And <clears throat> and we next day we go to the, the kitchen where we were I think we were somewhere at the palm the palms or something like that in, near mm -hmm. DC. And we unpack our coolers and everything like that. And you know, my cooler the big white cooler it says Ed on it. It's been wrapped up. And I, I I'm, someone tampered with it. I'm like, where where's my pea puree? I you know I have everything that I need for it, but there's no pea puree. Yeah. So there's clips of me like, <laughs> like <laughs> where the fuck is my you know, Yeah. I couldn't find it for the life of me. Yeah. And and but we I was on the show with this one guy. And he was always like, you know, he wanted to make a foie gras tour shown on a quick fire. You've made a couple 
torsions in your life, right? Can you make a torsion in less than 20 minutes? No, but ask me again how long, when's the last time I made one if I remember well, how to do Ed, it? Can you tell the audience what a torsion is? It's, I love it. Uh, so it's, it's beautiful, beautiful French foie gras um, that's, you know, kind of cleaned and then we, we kind of cure it. A mm -hmm. quick cure overnight with some, um, you know, Armagnac or brandy and, you know, quattro piece, salt, pepper, a little cell rose. Uh, and we kind of just let it hang out and kind of do a quick little cure on it. And then after that, we take, you know, your, your towels, your torsion, mm -hmm. and you, you know, we used to do like one kilo uh, the foie gras lobes, and we would kind of roll those up mm -hmm. very tightly and slowly, slowly poach them. Mm -hmm. And and whether you have a duck stock or some something like that, or you know, then we got advanced and we put them in the cryovac and we would sous vide them for quite some time. But right. the end result, after like we would cook it for like an hour for like one kilo, and we'd take it out, cool it down, and then chill it, let it sit, and then you get an order of it, you unwrap it, and you just slice a nice a nice. I mean, look, you order foie gras, you want to get. Foie gras. Yeah. So we would do do a nice healthy portion of foie gras. Put that on a, a plate. Seasonal preserves, you know, um, toasted brioche. Oh, man, you're you making know. me fucking hungry right now. And you just spread that yeah. love all over the, yes. the the warm warm toast. Yeah. It's uh yeah, it's a beautiful beautiful duck liver spread or yeah. goose liver goose. spread. Uh, but you just said one key point is you have to marinate it ideally overnight it's, and it's your time competitor, consuming yeah and yeah because there's a network of veins too that you gotta no one wants to eat a big veiny <laughs> <big. Yeah. laughs> it's a liver it's a liver yeah, yeah. livers yeah yeah so but it's the it's a wonderful yeah a and wonderful so your competitor thing. wanted to make this uh on a quick fire challenge yeah, which so. is 20 minutes so that just tells you what type of person you're dealing with <laughs> yeah, what kind yeah. of maniac yeah. you're dealing with right. all right so so let's get back to the 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 cook uh, in the kitchen. So, um, you know, the night you know you go back to the house, you talk about yeah. things. And, oh, what are you making? What are you doing? You know this and that. And meanwhile, this guy Alex is like, he's like, eh, I don't know yet. And it's like, all right. So the day of the cook, you know, he's plating some stuff, and next thing you know, he's plating this pea puree. He's got a, no one never saw him. He had no idea what he was going to do. Right. So. He, he just found an existing ingredient all of a sudden. That's I mean, till this day, nobody nobody really knows exactly. Tom Colicchio said the the editors and everybody, the producers went back to footage and try to find. They're like, maybe you took it out of the cooler and you put it because I was right next to the dish room. Maybe you put it on the the plate drop off table mm -hmm. and you did. And I'm like, no, I'm not like that, man. But, are, mm -hmm. but weren't the contest? Mm -hmm. weren't the contest? You have to, you know, when you take a test and you have to prove how you got there. You know, mm. yeah, right. You yeah. have to show your calculations. So yeah. you have to show how you got that sauce. I don't think necessarily. They have so many cameras going on. I, I, I and that's just another thing that adds time to the production, yeah. which you already don't have enough of because you have so many contestants going on. Mm -hmm. That's what I think, at least. Uh, yeah. So, so he, so I, I made my dish and it, whatever. I didn't have the pea puree, but I had a nice I, I had a nice spring fricassee and, yeah. and the butter poached lobster. Just goes back to what I said. We don't need peas in this in this world. Let's get rid of them. <laughs> Give peas it, a chance. No, yes, dude, it didn't yeah. bring you any peas luck. on earth. Look behind yeah. you, Ed Cotton. Peas on earth. Yes, a fan exactly. Yeah, yeah, a, a fan sent us that because they know how much Frenchie hates peas. Excellent. They sent us uh, two cases of peas, a T-shirt, and uh, that tin sign. All because everyone loves Frenchie so much. And now you just need to remind him again to do it. That wasn't the intention, mm. but I guess I did. I'm sorry, buddy. By the way, we, yeah. the, the, the fans have given up on the fan art. Well, we haven't been pushing it as oh, okay. much lately. You know. Yeah. Uh, Not too crazy about a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this is, I mean, that looks exactly that like looks you. Exactly oh, like that me. looks exactly like us. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's a master. That's our before right weight. Oh, uh, okay. It's <laughs> not, not fat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, so, so he, yeah. so, and he ended up, uh, I made a great dish. Yep. He ended up winning. Wow. He, he won that challenge. Yeah. He, he got his face, a caricature on the wall yep. at, 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 uh, the Palm Steakhouse. I, so whatever. I, Fuck I, the Palm Steakhouse now. Um, 
So yeah, so that sucked. Yeah, but yeah. whatever. So that's the. Uh, it's not like I make this amazing like pea puree or anything. Right. It's it, it right. just listen. Everything obviously worked out for you because you're on this podcast oh, now. Yeah. yeah, the pin, you know the pinnacle, this is the pinnacle of, the, yeah, of success uh, for, for any chef out there. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I mean, my career just keeps taking. Oh, it's going off. Yeah. It's like up and up and up. So you did you did all this television, yeah. and I think in between you did some judging. You did beat Bobby Flay. Yeah, I which competed you on beat Bobby Flay. Yeah. Um, that was fun. And what did you what did you make? What did you? Well, challenge you, you know, here's another weird thing: is like, uh, you know, you submit like what what are your signature? And they dishes. steer you, right? Well, they do more than steer. <laughs> 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 so I submitted like, you know, three three things or something mm -hmm. like that. I figured, you know, this is what I'm. This yeah. is what I'd, I. Oh, I didn't get to submit. They just said that. Like, Can you do the French onion soup burger? Oh, really? For yeah. you? Yeah. It was oh. at the. It was right after. I was at another event after the food and wine festival, and then they came up to me and like, "Oh, can you?" Uh oh, so they yeah, they went in with you because Bobby very was coming intent. out with uh, more of the burger joints, mm. so it it just fit into what they wanted. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, they didn't want me. They <laughs> came back. <by, laughs> they wanted your burger. They wanted the burger. So, they wanted that vibe, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it was it was back and forth, back and forth, and. They're like, hey, we just let let us just throw this out there. You know, would you would you be interested in doing a show with for around Thanksgiving, utilizing leftover turkey? I'm like, uh, yeah. They're like, are you able to incorporate one of your signature dishes? No when shit. using leftover turkey, and I make a great chicken cacciatore. Yeah. Oh, like, we reacted to a video of kit, uh, chicken cacciatore, didn't we? We did. Oh no, no, that's uh, chicken chess. All right, sorry, keep going. Yeah. Which yeah. is the same thing. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I guess I could. I mean, I guess I could make a turkey cacciatore. Mm -hmm. So, so I was like, yeah, sure, that that won't be a problem. They're like, oh, you know, thanks for being accommodating and this and that. So I just said, I said, what kind of things will I expect? Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, oh, you'll have raw raw legs, you'll have a cooked turkey breast, you'll have, you know, carcass, you'll have this, 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 and that. I'm like, all right, cool. So I, I get there and I, uh, I, uh, I made, I was able to make the turkey cacciatore. Yeah. You know, in the same style as my chicken cacciatore. Yeah. So that worked out really well. And you kicked his ass. I did. I mean, I also kicked my own ass because I like I boned out the turkey wings. And I stuffed it with Italian sausage Holy and like shit. fontina and then breaded them and fried them and served like I, I braised the, the cooked legs that yeah. were given to me. I continue to cook them f longer, mm -hmm. um, you know, stew them longer. And, uh, you know, I made polenta and I made some easy, easier, uh, you know. Everybody uh, look up that episode. Yeah, yeah. definitely check they it out. They still, I mean, it's a gift that keeps on giving. They yeah. always air it right before or around Thanksgiving. Oh, no shit. So, but I really kicked the shit out of myself. Yeah. Um, Isn't it, we don't get royalties though. No. No. No, no I was like, oh no, I put it on my resume. I was, know? I was, yeah, I wasn't <laughs> able to pay rent with uh, street cred after I won, you know. I can't, can't go up to my landlord and be like, I beat Bobby Flay this month. I'm yeah. good, right? Good on that yeah. rent? No worries. So, that was, you know, there was another, the, my, my experience with that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. It was great. I mean, what, whether I would say something different because if I lost, I'd be like, yeah, it was okay. But no, yeah. I had a great, I had a great time. It awesome. was a good experience. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the food was well received. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you remember what Bobby made? Well, he made, he made, it, it almost looked like a turkey au vin. It looked like a. Like a coco vin? Exactly. Ooh. But there was like a. A massive amount of red wine. Like it didn't. There was you're missing that tomato. Um, that thickness. Yeah, he that, didn't have the oh, he didn't have okay. the time to right right to really yeah. make it work. It really reminded me of like a coco van, and it was very whiny wine. You know, so okay. um, it didn't it didn't. I don't think it was well yeah. well received. So. We've known each other over the years. I've mm -hmm. seen you come and go at several restaurants, but now you're a partner at Jack and yeah. Charlie's 118. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit more about how that came to be. And you have some exciting developments. I don't know if you're allowed to share it. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So let our audience know. Um, so, you know, the thing is when you're always looking for something, it never really happens. Mm -hmm. So then you kind of, you know, I was always looking for, you know, to do my own thing. 
like oh and it always came down to money yeah because i don't have any money mm -hmm. um so you know I, so i took jobs and you know hope one day that i'd be able to put it rub a couple nickels together and be able to open up something that i could call it my mm -hmm. own um and so one day a friend of mine who used to be in the business very smart guy because he got out of the business um <laughs> he he um sent me a, a text and we talk every every so often he, he's now a um he's a uh a real estate agent um and he's done extremely well for himself he's like hey man uh i just i just sold a house to this guy he belongs to a rest to a restaurant group and you know he starts telling me the whole story and you know they're they want to expand and they're looking for like a culinary d director and I'm like, well, you know, I was at a job that I wasn't really sure exactly, like, where is this job really taking mm -hmm. me? What's the end goal? Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, I'm like, Dom, you know, if you want, just give them my information, share my contact information with them. And sure. Next day, boom, phone rings. And it was this gentleman, uh, you know, Dom sold the house to in New Jersey. And so we agreed to meet. And, mm -hmm. and then it was like, you know, when you meet somebody that, you know, sometimes it's like you're feeling you know, each other out. Yeah, it's like yeah. well, it clicks. It was it, it was a, it was an instant like, yeah, like oh, awesome. did we go to school together? Like right. I, like it was we were very like comfortable and 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 so I met him and, and along with the the rest of the group of the the you know the two other gentlemen mm -hmm. uh, that are involved, and um, we just we we started chat and kind of develop a little bit of a, a rapport with mm -hmm. one another and um just kind of kept building off of that and then a space became available down in the west village which i think it's a kind of an iconic space mm -hmm. uh there's a lot of history in in, in, the, in the, the restaurant space and uh we all met down there and we we you know we kind of looked around and looked at everything. And I was very familiar with the space because I had previously worked down on 13th Street. It definitely has like an old soul New York yeah. vibe. It like does. It, yeah. or, it's already yeah. have, already has a life of its own. Yeah. yeah. So they're like, you know, we just signed the lease on this space. So like, this, is a, no, this is a great space. So we started. Wait, so they signed the lease before you were confirmed to work there as a the chef? Yeah, because wow. that space was not going to sit around. There was oh, okay. that thing yeah. would have gone off the market in a matter of. It's like let's let's just build a bridge. We'll get there. Mm, yeah. Wow. wow. So, so they jumped on it. I met them, and like, you know, I said, you know, there was a lot of uh, back and forth mm -hmm. about like, you know, building the the, making the idea become a reality mm -hmm. and the concept and like all that stuff. So. Um, I think I think we we sat down and we talked enough in detail about what we envisioned for the space, mm -hmm. to, and we I think we really we we nailed it. Yeah, yeah, it's gorgeous, so, thousand percent. So yeah, so they brought me on as a partner with the with the restaurant. Oh, so you didn't start as a partner. You you came in. There was agree. There was agreements. Okay. Uh, I I was going in to this under the notion that I was going to assist them and be a culinary director of of. But when I walked into the space, everything kind of just changed mm -hmm. for me. And I kind of you fell in love. Yeah, I fell in love. And um, they brought me in. Um, in they brought me on uh, as a as a partner mm -hmm. with the space uh, for Jack and Charlie's. And I think. The, the end goal here and my my journey with with this small group of guys is we're going to continue mm -hmm. the, the next step. So we just recently signed a lease for a space here in the city um, on 31st in Lexington. And um, that's going to be a, uh, you know, a different concept than Jack and Charlie's. Mm -hmm. So we'll, um, we'll do a, um, yeah, I don't know if I, I I'll divulge that mm -hmm. much, but um, cause we're still, I, I mean, we, it's, completely demoed right now mm -hmm. so we we're go we're going to start building hammer and nails are very soon mm -hmm. so uh we should be open late summer if all goes well of this year of this year yeah. nice. awesome so right. right now Congrats. we have just the the blank canvas so 
Um, so, so that, um, that will be, uh, in the very near future. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's some other things that are kind of, you know, that pop up along the way. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of availability, you know, there's a lot of available restaurant space. Definitely. Yes. Right now. There's, yeah. uh, and there are a lot of great spaces. There are a lot well. of great opportunities in the fact that, you know, a lot of people unfortunately put a ton of money building a space and then it just didn't cut yeah. it. And yeah. now someone else come come in and reap off of their their reward uh, benefit you know? so it's like so there's a couple other things that are floating around as well but mm -hmm. the 31st street space will that will it's a big space it's two floors and wow. it'll be well over 200 seats so um that's going to keep me busy for a little while yeah and then I'm yeah. glad we locked you down now before because once that place opens, you're yeah. probably going to be a much busier man than yeah. you are now. So I'll I'll be I'll be needing a chef de cuisine for that space, mm -hmm. um, and I'll you know space for Jack and Charlie's. I'll bounce back and forth between the both both spaces, um, but I will need a partner in crime mm -hmm. to run Thirty First Street. Um, as a chef to cuisine. You guys heard it here. Email Ed Cotton at <laughs> yes. E Cotton at Jack and Charlie's 118.com. There you go. All right. We're gonna help Ed over here find his chef to cuisine. Um, that is an awesome story. I love having you on, uh, whether it's Pro Chef Reacts or here. But uh before we sign off, we're gonna start to sign off really soon because I don't I also don't want to take up too much more of your time. But uh yeah, let the camera know right here, you know, where they can find out more about you and uh, where they should be visiting you at. You can always find me behind the stove at Jack and Charlie's, 118 Greenwich Avenue, right in the heart of the West Village. Um uh I you know, I I'm there all the time. Um, and then I'm looking forward to, you know, what comes down the road with the new space. So that's how we're right. working. Chef signs off. Yeah. yeah for real. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Frenchie, before we sign off, do you have, uh, anything else you want to say? Anything you want no. to tell the people? I mean, was, I was basking in, in Ed Cotton. Yeah, no, you know, it was good to hear your story, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's always great to hang out with you guys yeah. and, and shoot the shit. Frenchie and I have been thinking about trying to do uh, another karaoke night for old times' sake. I don't think I I went to the. We ha that's well. Here's a demise. That's the problem. We got we have to get uh, what's his face Becker. <laughs> Why are you saying it like that? Because what's his face? <laughs> Well, it doesn't well, matter. It, it's just, it's meant to be well, a Well, it's his it's thing, right? Yeah, uh, the, yeah, yeah. That's his thing. That's, yeah, his, that's his baby. His karaoke, yeah. he loves that yeah, shit. Yeah, we'll so. definitely have him on. But you need to be there just to hang out. He's just a little over the top. Let's put it that way. But, he really gets into it. that's what you it. want at karaoke. I know. That is, that but is. he takes it seriously. He loves it. He's, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. We we just want to like ah. right, so uh, well, <laughs> there will be a Feasty Boys episode. That Feasty Boys is our segment where we visit restaurants, where it'll segue into a karaoke night. But yeah, Ed Cotton, thanks again for coming on to the podcast. And guys, hope you enjoyed this episode as we did making it. And remember, don't be afraid to fail because it can only make you stronger. With that said, I'm Chef Brian Sauer, not your typical chef, Frenchy. I'm Ed Cotton. <laughs> we'll see you guys really soon. Say bye to the wide cam. Right there. Bye. Ciao.